All right, so welcome to the Columbia AWS Meetup. And tonight we're going to talk about Fat Lambda. Now, Fat Lambda is not actually, if you search for it, it doesn't actually exist. I just made that up. It's just a, a serverless strategy that exceeds the limits of Lambda. My name is Dan Rusk, as Jeff said. Uh, I'm the VP of Software Development here at Thorn Technologies. We're a consulting firm. We have a product now we're excited about. We're trying to transfer into the product space. Uh, it's called SHP Gateways on the AWS Marketplace. Check it out. Um, other than that, we do a lot of cloud consulting. We still do mobile development. Uh, we do a lot of web development too. But uh, we found that all of our backends were on the cloud, so we focus more on the cloud now, as that seems to be the place to go now. So today we're going to talk about uh, ECS and Docker. What is Fargate? The Fat Lambda strategy, a real world <coughs> use case of Fat Lambda strategy that we ran into. And I'm going to give you a demo of how to actually create one of these Fat Lambdas. And then we'll talk about the pricing and the conclusion income too. So ECS is the uh, one of the core components of this strategy that I'm going to talk about. It's the Elastic Container Service on AWS. That means you can run, stop, and manage Docker containers on EC2 clusters. And hopefully by the end of this uh, talk, you'll understand that more if you don't understand it now, what Docker containers are and everything. You can run one-off tests. that will be like a Lambda where it just fires up and then shuts itself down. Or you can have long-running services like you can have web servers or databases on these uh, Docker containers. To be more, if you're interested, you can check out these uh, link later. I'll post these slides. So what are Docker containers? So Docker containers are kind of like virtual machines, but without the whole uh, hardware emulation side of the virtual machine. So they're a lot lighter than virtual machines. They're just the app layer. So it has the app and everything you need to run the app inside of it, including the entire environment. So you can have... Uh, different kinds of Linux or, or you know, entire web servers inside this container, run it on a host, and have it isolated from everything else on your machine. Uh, but it can still access other things on your machine through the network layer. So you can network all these together through the local host. Uh, and ultimately, what you end up with is just these Docker files that look kind of like that. These Docker files are just text files, and you can start with a base image of... You see here, this is a Python Docker file. So it just starts with a base image of Python 3, and then it creates some directories and installs some requirements, and then it just runs a Python script. And that's the entire Docker container. Am I going to stuff over up here? Okay. So why use Docker containers? So Docker containers are very developer friendly as opposed to virtual machines or you know, having them install all the software on their own machines. Uh, you can run isolated architectures on the local machine that uh, will run the same as if it were running on production. And the containers are defined in a text file, so you can check in that text file to source control and share it with other people. So there are lots of official uh, container images I'm not sure if I can click on this link here. Yeah, here. So check out if you check out that link, you can see there are servers for Nginx or Docker images for Nginx, Mongo, MySQL, Postgres, Node. You can run all these services on your computer and you can shut them down very easily. In addition, you can customize and share your own container images. So if you have a specific setup you want to uh, share, you can start with a base layer of either a Linux uh, operating system or even Windows, and then build on top of that with uh, kind of like how you would do user data in EC2. You just specify the steps you would want to uh, run your you know, installs or copying over files from your local machine to the Docker image 
and then you would just have it, uh, a command at the end that would start everything up. In addition, it's compatible with many cloud providers, including AWS, or you can just host your own. Uh, Docker is open source, at least community edition, and uh, it allows you to do things like uh, a lot of companies these days are doing this lift and shift approach where they will dockerize all their architecture right now, and then they can take all those Docker containers and then uh, run them in the cloud. And then it's just a straight transfer over without having to worry about uh, how things are going to work together. It will just run the same on the cloud as it does in their local uh, on-prem data center. So on AWS specifically, uh, we have ECS, the Elastic Container Service, and that can run Docker containers. They're coming out with um, something called EKS soon, it's in preview, and that is for Kubernetes pods, uh, which is a, another container that's similar to Docker that Google made. But ECS can run Docker containers, and you can create a cluster of EC2 instances to, to run these Docker containers, because as you saw in the previous slide, uh, you're not defining the whole virtual machine. It still has to run on a host. So you can either create an EC2 instance that will run Docker, or you can use Fargate to just throw your Docker containers out into the wild, and uh, AWS has a managed EC2 cluster that will run your Docker containers for you. So that's where the serverless portion comes in with Fargate. Uh, and you can create custom Docker images uh, in AWS and, and push them up to this Elastic Container Repository that's also inside of ECS. I'm going to show you how that, all that works later. So Fargate is relatively new. It was uh, announced in November during uh, reInvent. It's an alternative to the EC2 clusters you normally would have to set up for ECS. So ECS involved not only creating these Docker containers, but you had to create a cluster of EC2 instances that would auto-scale and, uh, you know, you'd have to manage all that auto-scaling and set up all the security groups and everything like that. And that was a little bit of a barrier to use ECS. But they've gotten rid of that barrier to, with Fargate. So Fargate is just a managed cluster by uh, AWS where they will uh, manage all the updates you need to perform on these EC2 instances and make sure everything just works. So you can deploy Docker containers without worrying about scaling of clusters or maintaining the instances. So if you have the EC2 clusters, uh, occasionally they'll come out with updates to the ECS agent that runs on these clusters, and you'd have to manually update that. But with Fargate, you don't even have to worry about that. It'll just always stay up to date. <coughs> so you can run one-off tasks, which I'm calling fat lambdas, or you can run services that are long-running tasks, like web servers and uh, databases. So if you're interested, you can click on that link later and see more about Fargate. So Fargate's not a direct replacement for Lambda, but it does get rid of some of those limits that you run into with Lambda, which is Lambda is the traditional serverless option with AWS. So Fargate's the more uh, recent offering. But with Lambda, you have certain limits. So in Lambda, you have a five minute max runtime. <coughs> so if your task runs for more than five minutes, it'll just shut down. Uh, but in Fargate, you have no time limit. You can run as long as you want. Lambda also has a 512 megabyte disk that you can work with while Fargate has a 10 gigabyte disk. Lambdas also have between 128 megabytes of memory to three gigabytes of memory, while you can go up to 30 gigabytes with Fargate. And also with Lambdas, you only have 50 megabytes of uh, compressed code size you can work with. But with uh, Fargate, you have four gigabytes of container image layers. So four gigabyte per layer, which I'll touch on later what a layer is. Uh, Lambda, you also can't control how much CPU you get. It's just based on how much memory you specify. With Fargate, you can specify between a quarter of a virtual CPU to four, four CPUs. So that's 
uh, roughly equivalent to like a extra large instance. So what's the fat lambda strategy? So fat lambda is just an ECS task that is run in Fargate. So it's a serverless ECS task. So it just means a, con a Docker container that runs and then shuts itself down without you having to specify any kind of EC2 instance for it to run on. So when a task is too big for Lambda, you should switch to the fat Lambda strategy. And I'll talk about a particular use case we ran into uh, where this made sense. So the strategy implementation. So when you're writing code with your, uh, for, for Lambda, you can write with Python, you can write with Go, uh, you can do C Sharp now, and uh, Java and JavaScript. Uh, so you can take that code and wrap it into a Docker container uh, for a fat Lambda. Then you just have to deploy that container to an, the Elastic Container Repository. And then you can run that container as a task in Fargate. Now these containers can be scheduled with CloudWatch or you can use some other trigger like a Lambda to actually trigger it. So Lambda and uh, these ECS tasks work really well together. So if a task is too big when the Lambda is running, you can just pass it off to the uh, ECS task. So eventually, uh, when you're using Fargate, you should still consider converting to an EC2 cluster if price is a concern or you need to control more power or you need more power over the uh, settings, which I'll talk about as well, too. So here's our real-world usage. So we had a goal to have a near real-time ETL process. So ETL is uh, a process to load a, a database or a data warehouse. So we were loading a Redshift data warehouse from log files that were posted to S3 every 5 to 15 minutes. So we could have a, a bunch of log files coming in from various sources, and we wanted to just load them in the a data warehouse and then transform the data and then, uh, and then clean everything up. We tried Lambda and step functions. So we tried Lambda originally, uh, but it was running for more than five minutes because we have no control over uh, how fast the ETL process runs because it's actually running inside of Redshift. We're sending commands to Redshift to load the data. We're sending SQL commands. Uh, so basically, we're just sitting there babysitting these commands, and they would just time out because it exceeded the five-minute limit, especially uh, during the, the vacuum phase. So there's this phase in Redshift that's familiar to Postgres uh, where you vacuum your data because Redshift uh, as you're inserting and updating data, it'll just keep old data in there, so it'll move faster. And then you have to call this vacuum command to resort the data and uh, clean out all the old data. That can run for a long time if it's uh, if the cluster, the Redshift cluster, is not very big or if there's a lot of data. So we went from Lambda and we switched to step functions. We tried to break down our Lambda into smaller steps. We thought that would be a better way to uh, extend our runtime in Lambda. But uh, that one step, the vacuum step, still ran over five minutes, so the step functions didn't work. It was DOA. Uh, but also, we found that they were kind of, they were difficult to work with because you had to run them on the cloud. There was no way to run the step functions locally. So it was, we had to deploy it, you know, and have it write to log files and then figure out where it went wrong there we couldn't just set breakpoints or anything like that or run it on our local machine. So we decided to go with the fat lambda strategy. Yeah, and, and, and sorry, Rob, that we made you do all that stuff function work that just got thrown away. So here's the architecture we ended up with. It actually ended up being really simple. So we had all these log files coming in to S3. And as they came in, S3 has an option to uh, send the, an event to SQS declaring that the file exists. Then uh, they would just get queued up inside of there. So we'd have as many files as we needed in there. And there's a CloudWatch event happening here that just set off an event every one minute to fire this Lambda. 
And all this lambda does is it checks if the ECS task is running or not. And if it's not running, then it'll start the ECS task. That ECS task will then pull up to a thousand messages from each queue that we had here and uh, create a manifest file <coughs> to load into Redshift. And then it would copy everything over to Redshift and then uh, do the rest of the sequential ETL load. So transform the stage data and then vacuum it all up. And it's turned out to work really well because the ECS task, it doesn't matter how much power that has. All it has to do is uh, babysit these SQL commands that we're running. So it didn't matter. We just needed a quarter of a vCPU to run it. But what we needed over a Lambda was the time. We need that time unbounding so we can run it for you know, 10 minutes or 15 minutes if we need to, depending on how much data we want to load at the same time. So this worked out for great for us. Uh, honestly, the ECS task is not running in Fargate because uh, we, we want to run this task all the time. And I'll talk about why you want to switch to an EC2 instance in that case as opposed to Fargate uh, in a later slide. It really has to do with price. And uh, if you talk to Rob, it really has to do with uh, cloud formation taking a really long time to start up these Fargate tasks. Which Amazon may have fixed by now, but it was, uh, it was taking about three hours to deploy our cloud formation as opposed to like one minute. Yeah. All right, so let's do a demo of a fat lambda handoff. So what I'm going to show you is how you write this lambda that will fire off this ECS task and then deploy it to Fargate to have a serverless Docker container running in AWS. Now, ultimately, all this Docker container is going to do is write a log message. You guys are keeping it super simple. Uh, but it could do anything. You could you could give it roles. It's operating in AWS. You could give it roles to access your S3 buckets, which we did. You give it uh, roles to get credentials from Redshift, so you don't even need login credentials stored in your Docker container. It'll just automatically pull down credentials based on that role, uh, which we did. Uh, you could have it post to SNS. You could post to SQS. You could do anything. You could interact with all the other services in AWS. It's like a really a truly integrated experience, just like Lambda, but fatter. Okay. Let's go through these steps. So before you can really develop with uh, Docker and Fat Lambda, you need Docker Community Edition and the AWS CLI. Now, I'm not going to go over how to install those right now, because I'm trying to keep this as short possible, but uh, if you just look up Docker Community Edition, there'll be a version for your operating system. And the AWS CLI as well. That's the command line interface for AWS. Now I have some starter code for you at, uh, at this link that I've loaded up on my machine. And then I'm going to show you, you can build the, the Docker image locally, and you can run it locally to test it. So let's do that. So here's the code that you'll see when you go into uh, let me get the presentation mode. When you go into the uh, GitHub repository and pull it down, uh, the README is very sparse right now. I'll add more to it for you guys later, so you can follow along. Uh, but all I have in here is this demo file, and this is where the, the, the Docker command will run. So this is just straight Python. It's just importing logging, which is a standard Python library. Uh, is setting up logging to have uh, the info level and to have this format that I like that shows the line number and file name that the log message happened from. This is for debugging purposes. <coughs> and then uh, it just logs this message that the fat lambda started. And it also has a lambda method in here that we'll get into later. Now the other part of this is this Docker file. So Docker file is the default uh, 
name that Docker looks for. So if you just have Docker file, yeah. Okay. So Docker file is the default name, so it just makes it easier to run the commands. Uh, so you don't have to specify a file name. Then we have from Python 3 Alpine as the first line of the Docker file. So there's all these images that you can find on Docker, on the Docker Hub, that you can start from, all these official repositories. And one of them is Python. So you can specify Python 3, you can, you can specify whatever version you want. And then I have this dash alpine at the end uh, that's just specifying this special version of Linux, a special flavor of Linux that's really light, which is a really lightweight one. Uh, I could just have Python 3 here, but it, I think it fires up on like Ubuntu or something, and it's, it's pretty heavy. It's a difference of like 250 megabytes when you create this image. So we don't have any special needs for Linux, so having alpine is fine with, with this case. But you go as heavyweight as you want. Uh, then we just set a working directory on the uh, Docker container we want to work with in this Docker file, just to make these copy commands er easier later. Then we are copying over this requirements.txt, so that's a, a Python requirements file that just specifies the dependencies we want to load. So in this case we're loading Boto3, which is the AWS SDK for Python. So that way it's acting like the Lambda where we have access to Boto3 uh, immediately. Then it's running pip install on the Docker container. So it's installing those requirements. Then we're just copying over everything inside the source directory, which is right here, to the local directory on the Docker machine, which is this working directory. <coughs> then we're running Python demo.py. So we're just running our Python file. So it's very, it's very simple. It is the entire Docker file. All the magic is really happening in this base image here. That's the cool thing about Docker. You can take these base images that do all this work and just modify them, you know, and add to them, kind of like inheritance. So that's the entire Fat Lambda process right there. Just this Docker file and this source file. So we can. Pull up a terminal. So we can test this out by building it. So we're in there, docker build t, and then we're just giving it a name. And, oh, I always forget this. You need to specify the uh, source directory where the docker file is. So we're in the current directory, so I'm just doing dot. So that just ran through our Docker file and created a Docker image. So we can just run that Docker image by specifying the, the tag that we just uh, tagged it with here, the fat lambda demo. Now let's instantiate our Docker container and then printed out uh, the output from that. So it, it took the standard out from that Docker container and just put it here and all that we did you know, we just ran this logging.info. So we see here, that's my nice line number that I like in the, uh, the output, log output. So our Docker container is working. So now we can move on to step two, if I can find it. Here it is. So step two is to set up ECR and push Docker. So we need to set up the Elastic Container Repository on AWS and follow commands on how to push. And I uh, have this login command down here, which you'll see why we have that in a second. So I logged into AWS console. And uh, we're going to go to the Elastic Container Service. Now here I have a couple clusters here uh, from testing this earlier. So you can ignore those. Another thing to note is I would switch to another region, but uh, Fargate's only available in US East 1 right now, so, so I gotta use this region again. So I'm gonna create a repository. Unfortunately, I meant to delete that first one. It's gonna be Fat Lambda Demo 3. And here it gives you some commands on how to 
build and push your image up to the repository to make it pretty simple. Now the first command is telling you to run this, but if you're on Windows, you can run this command here. Uh, so what this command up here does, I can show you. I'll just show you. How about that? What this command up here does is uh, it uses your AWS CLI, it accesses ECR to get a login command that does not include email for this US East 1 region. So Docker has its own build and push system, so you need to log in via Docker to push to a repository. So this will actually give you a login command uh, Okay, so I didn't copy my default correctly. So if you have it in a different profile, you can just specify the profile. Docker will give you, or this command will give you this docker login dash u AWS and it'll give you a ridiculous password uh, and then give the repository URL. Do we have to memorize that? <laughs> no. Yes, no. you have to type it manually. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can download the uh, video. Yeah, oh yeah, you could, yeah. So that's a temporary password, so it's just a token that lasts for an hour. So it'll, yeah. So you gotta get home now and do it. <laughs> Take a screenshot. Uh, so if you're on Windows PowerShell, it gives you this command to, uh, to actually run that Docker login command right when uh, you get it. So you don't have to copy and paste it and run it again. I was like, why didn't they say anything about Linux or Mac? So here, I'm saying something about it. You can actually run this command here to uh, evaluate that command that's passed back and just run it immediately. So it's just, it just, this is script friendly, which we definitely employ in our solutions. So uh, I guess I guess it's just type it out manually. That always works great. So I'm gonna do eval, and I'm gonna paste the command and add my profile to it and close it off. So now I'll run that Docker login for me and say login succeeded. So yeah, you, to, ha to have all this working, you have to have the AWS CLI, like I said, and the, uh, the Docker uh, CLI as well. You all see the bottom, uh, barely. Okay. So next step, we have to do docker build dash t, uh, and we'll tag it fat lambda demo three. So we just copy and paste that command that it uh, gave us. Then we need to tag this image that we built with an image tag that exists in the repository. So it doesn't work quite like uh, GitHub where you can just push it up and then tag it there. You have to associate them before you upload it. That's all that does. And then we're gonna go ahead and push that image straight up to that repository. And this is why I'm hardwired in, just so you guys don't steal my bandwidth. <laughs> and this is the big layer. So each of these is a layer, an image layer in Docker. So each of these for Fargate needs to be under four gigabytes, which is very easy to do. You saw the biggest one we had in this image was 78 megabytes. So if you're doing something with four gigabytes, it's probably on Windows. We finish all these commands, we press done, and we see our image right here. It's 35 megabytes, it has a SHA-1 digest. Uh, if we wanted to push up another image, we could and we could uh, tag it with another version number and we could access that version later if we wanted to, uh, but this just has one image in it right now. All right, so that step's done. So step three, create a Fargate cluster. So in order to run these Docker containers, we have to have these clusters. Now you can create these clusters with EC2 or Fargate or a combination of the two, uh, but it's very simple to start up in Fargate. So we hit create cluster uh, if you missed it, I hit clusters up here in ECS and create cluster. 
And then we have a choice between networking only, which is the powered by AWS Fargate, or EC2 Linux, or EC2 Windows. EC2 Windows is uh, it's only a couple months old. It's a relatively new addition. So with Fargate, all we have to do is specify a cluster name. And then we can choose to create a VPC or use the uh, VPC we already created. So I'll just do create a VPC to make it exciting. I'm going to do 10.8 for each of these. And by default, it'll create two subnets for you, but you can create more than that if you wanted to. So now it's going to use confirmation behind the scenes to start up our VPC cluster and register uh, Fargate for us. So Fargate uh, is a managed maximum number of VPCs. Great. Fargate's a managed, uh, just not create one, a managed serverless EC2 cluster for uh, ECS. But in order to operate inside of our private subnets, it creates these uh, network interfaces that Fargate can communicate through. So that's a common way that uh, AWS will give you these, these network interfaces into your subnet when the services are not actually inside your subnet. Just like a virtual network interface. So we're going to view this cluster, and you see it has nothing in it right now. So it has zero tasks in it. So while it's not being used, we're not paying for it. It's just, you know, serverless. You know, we, we're not using it. We don't pay for it. So we created our Fargate cluster. That's step three. Step four and five get a little bit more complicated. So uh, step four, we're going to create the test definition, which, uh, which will use that container that we created in you know, step one and step two. So here we're going to go test definitions, and these these set up the uh, you know the size of the the container we want to create, and as well as the images that we're going to use. So we can specify a Fargate launch com uh, compatibility or EC2, and we're going to do a Fargate one. So we're just going to create a, a task here. If you're familiar with programming, this is kind of like, you know, we're defining a blueprint for a task. You know, we're defining the class. Uh, we're not instantiating the task yet, so we're just specifying the rules for this task. So we can give it a task role if we wanted to, if we wanted to access other services. But for this case, we're just uh, accessing CloudWatch, so we get that for free. So we're not going to specify a role. And then uh, we also have this task execution role down here. Now you can say create new role, um, but that actually takes a really long time to fire up for some reason when we were testing it earlier. Uh, what is better is if you create your own ECS task role, and I'll show you what that one looks like so you can create it. So if you go to IAM, you just open up another window. You just create a role, uh, and you would want a ECS task role. So we go to Elastic Container Service. Uh, and it's Elastic Container Service task. And then we just choose the uh, what we have here, the Amazon ECS task execution role policy. I'm just going to do task. It always pops it up. And then we're going to create that role. So then we can use that role inside of our task definition. And by default, that role uh, with this managed policy just allows you to you know, pull images from ECR. That's very important. You know, the, the Docker image needs to be able to access the container repository to pull down that image and create itself. And then it has the uh, permissions to 
write to CloudWatch so we can access log files later. So we can go ahead and use this ECS task execution rule, which is the exact same as the one I just showed you. Now we have to specify a task size, and like I said, you can go from half a gigabyte up to 30 gigabytes. But when you choose different uh, amounts of memory, you have different CPU options available to you. So the lowest tier of memory is matched to the lowest tier of CPU. So the valid CPU for half a gigabyte of memory is 0.25 beef CPU. If we wanted more memory, then we'd have to uh, you know, be within the range of what's valid. So there's, there's 50 different combinations of these memories to uh, beef CPU. Uh, but we're just going to stick with the lowest one. So this task definition, we're just specifying the size, how big it is, what role it gets. Now we need to specify the Docker container that we're going to use. So we're going to add a container to it. So we're going to add one or more containers to our task definition. But for Fat Lambda, we're just going to add one container. So we'll call this one the Fat Lambda. Now here we have to give it a, a, a URL for the <coughs> image. It's not actually a URL, it's more like a a Docker URL. So we can specify a public Docker container here, which I've done before, um, or we can specify the ECR Docker container that we already loaded up. So let's get back to Elastic Container Service in this other tab, and we're going to go to the repositories, and we're going to access Fat Lambda Demo 3 that I just uh, populated. If you saw on the first here, Go back one step. Here's a repository URL right there. But if you go into it, you can just access the repository URI right here. And that's the one you want. So you go ahead and paste this in here. And that's the uh, image that we want. And then we can specify the limit of memory that this task will have access to. And since this is the only task inside of our container, we might, or the only container inside of our task, we might as well give it all the memory, so 512 megabytes. If we had any port mappings or anything like that, we could specify them here, but it's just a task. It's not going to have a long running port open. We could also specify all this stuff, but it's not necessary. It's all optional. So now we see we used up all the memory with that one container. We're not going to add any volumes. We're just going to go ahead and create. And our test definition is done. So let's test it out. So to test out your test definition, you hit run task. Now we're going to specify the launch type, what platform of Fargate we want to use. So if they if they come out with a version 1.1 and you don't want to migrate to it yet, you can just you know specify 1.0 directly, or you just use whatever the latest is. Uh, then we choose a cluster. So that is the one I just created earlier. You can fire up multiple tasks at once, or just one. Uh, and then we can create, or we can use the uh, VPC and subnets that we want for Fargate. So we're going to use this 10.9 that I set up earlier and uh, use both subnets. Now it's going to create a default security group for you. Um, you can edit it to use an existing one, but we're going to go ahead and use this one that I created. Now we don't really need a public IP, but I'm just going to leave it there for now. You get up to 20 public IPs for Fargate tasks, so if you don't need it, you really shouldn't use it, but I'm going to break the rules. Security group does not exist, so I guess from editing it, I broke it. Okay, I'm just going to use one of the ones that were created earlier. So traditionally, if you didn't press edit, it should just work. That must be a bug in AWS system. So this one was created earlier by automatically. You see this fat lamb 2540. So I'm going to go ahead and use that one. So now you see uh, this task is trying to run down here. We're inside our cluster view now. See up here? And we're inside the fat lambda demo cluster. So we see the task its desired status is running, but its current status or last status is provisioning. And now it's pending. So this is the point where it needs to create 
the network interface inside those subnets and uh, create that container and then associate it with that network interface and actually run the task. And this could take uh, a couple minutes, really, with Fargate. If you have an EC2 cluster, it actually runs faster because it, all that infrastructure is already set up. So I'm going to let that run for a second. And then we'll, we'll view the output in CloudWatch. So the output is going to look like this. If you go over to CloudWatch, I'm control clicking to open another tab. Then we're going to have a uh, created a log stream. It doesn't have any logs in it yet because the task hasn't run. But if you look at this old uh, log stream, it has a message in there that has the time, you know, the line number, the log level, and that the fat lambda was started. See it back there. So it's the same log message we saw in our console when we ran the Docker container. So that was all given to us by for free. Uh, when we set, set up our task definition, um, there's an option at the bottom that's default click that says send logs to CloudWatch, and it sets up all the permissions for you for that. You could turn that off if you don't want the logs to go to CloudWatch. If you have some kind of internal system that sends it to S3 or something, uh, you could use that instead. But uh, by default, uh, standard out goes to CloudWatch. Let's see if it ran. Yep, it ran, so it's gone. So we can go check CloudWatch. Uh, this was the Fat Lambda demo task, and we see the log stream here. So every time you run the task, it'll give you a different log stream. And we see the Fat Lambda, the fat lambda started here. So that's another difference with uh, Lambdas. Lambdas will reuse old containers. They'll reuse old Lambdas when they can. If the Lambda was executed recently, it'll just reuse that Lambda to uh, to execute the code again, execute that method. And when that happens, it'll use the same log stream. But in uh, ECS, each execution is an isolated event, so it's going to create a new log stream. All right, step five, set up Lambda and test it. So, so far, we created the ECS task, but the only way we can fire it is either manually or if we set up a CloudWatch event to you know, fired on a, a cron schedule. So if we wanted to hook it up to other events, like uh, an S3 put or something like that, then we would need a Lambda to act as an intermediary. You know, the Lambda can fire based on a bunch of events, and then it can fire the ECS task. And Lambdas are basically free, so why not? So we're going to create a new blank Lambda, and then copy the code we have in our... Uh, repository. So we're going to hit create function. It'll probably pop up another screen if you don't have any lambdas. Uh, but you'll still hit the same thing, create lambda. You can author from scratch. Unfortunately, they don't have any, I should probably submit this to the serverless application repository, but they don't have any kind of ECS test kickoff ones yet. So let's call it fat lambda kickoff. I think I might already have one that's called kickoff, so I'm just call it starter. Now here in Lambda, we can specify any of these languages we want. We're going to stick with Python 3.6. Uh, we got to choose a role, and it's actually important here. So they have all these roles from templates that you can choose from, but again, none of them have a template for ECS task launches. Yet. I'm sure they'll add it sometime soon, especially after they all watch my video, right? So, uh, so we have to create our own role. Uh, we can just do that here, and then we can modify it later. So we're going to create a custom role, and we'll call this, you know, at Lambda Execution. Now, the default policy document uh, is to just be able to write to CloudWatch. And we could edit this if we wanted to, you know, go freehand JSON, but we don't need to, so let's not do that. We'll just come back to this later to edit it. So we created this role down here, and then we're going to go ahead and create the function. Now, the Lambda interface has changed a lot since uh, my last video, from like 18 months ago. Uh, 
and down here we have this Cloud9 embedded IDE. And Cloud9 is like Amazon's uh, Cloud IDE, so you can do all this serverless uh, debugging. So if, you, if you're developing Lambdas, you don't need to start up the Cloud9 instance that they recommend. You can just go to your Lambda and access Cloud9 IDE in every function, which is pretty cool. So we're going to use it. We're going to copy and paste. So here's the Lambda inside, the, uh, inside that repository. I'm going to paste it over to the other screen. Or I can talk about it here since it's bigger. So all this does is import Boto3, which is included by default on the Lambdas. It has a Lambda handler. Uh, and then it just has some hard-coded values in here in order to launch the task. So uh, we're going to put in a cluster name, the task definition name, and then the subnets that we uh, specified when we did that task run, and a security group, same thing. So with Fargate launch, we have to specify this stuff. If we were doing an EC2 launch, we wouldn't need to specify this because the EC2 instance would already exist and it would already have all these subnets set up and everything. So uh, for Fargate, it sets it up dynamically. So it just does that and then it uh, returns the response. It's very simple. The Lambda we actually use for uh, the real world example I showed you, I said it, it checks first if uh, the ECS task is running before it tries to run it, uh, which is a tiny bit more complicated, but not much more. We wrote it in like 20 minutes. Um, but this one just fires the task no matter what. So did I copy? Let's copy and let's paste. So now we need to enter our cluster name, our test definition name, subnet, and security group. So the easiest way to do all this information, you know, instead of going to like the EC2 VPCs and like scouring for the subnets there and all that, it's just to, you know, try to run your task again. So here's the name. We're going to do action, run task, and we're going to do Fargate. We're going to copy this task definition name, that's one piece of information we need, right here. We need the cluster name that we want to fire it into, so we have the Fat Lambda demo cluster here, so we're going to use that. Then we need the subnet 1, subnet 2, so let's go get those. So we want it to be in 10.9, I'll we'll grab subnet 1, subnet 2, and then here we can copy and paste these subnet IDs. And then we need a security group that the uh, ECS task will run in. We can choose, let's choose a different one. We're going to select the existing one, so we're not creating one, and we're going to use a security group ID. So this is the same one we used on the last launch. By the way, that security group, all it does is, you know, it opens port 80. That's all it's doing. I don't even think it's necessary. And they're just going to say assign public IP disabled because we don't need the public IP. So for our Lambda uh, rules, you know, if our, let's see, we don't really need anything here. So it's going to take less than three seconds. You know, we could bump this a little bit if we wanted to. Uh, we can, we have this fat Lambda execution role that we haven't fully set up yet. Uh, you know, we could even, like what we do for our uh, Lambda like this, we have all these values specified as environment variables, so it's uh, cloud formation friendly. Um, so you can make it more generic and have it fire whatever task you wanted if you made them environment variables. But here we're just hard coding everything for the sake of simplicity. All right, so lambda function, lambda handler, we're inside lambda function.py, and the lambda handler is the name of our method, so that's all perfect. So you see, uh, up here it shows the resources the functions role has access to. We don't have access to ECS yet, so when we try to run this, you know, we could test this, we can 
we can use hello world, that's fine. We try to test this, we're gonna get an error that we don't have permission to ECS. So access denied when calling run task at operation. So we have to go and we have to modify this, uh, the role we created. So I'm gonna show you how to do that. So we need two extra permissions. And I created, this one is using fat lambda execution. So we'll go into the fat lambda execution under IAM roles, and then we're going to add an inline policy. Now here we can do a visual editing instead of using JSON, that's why we waited until here. So we're gonna do the EC2 container service, which I guess is the old name for Elastic Container Service. And we're going to select the run task operation here. Now here we could specify the exact task and limit it to that task, or we can just say all. Why not, why not all? So this will be our generic runner. And not only that, but we need one other permission so uh, when we're doing this run task, we have to specify a role or a default role. We have to specify a role or also use a default role for the uh, ECS task. Either way, we're passing a role onto this other service. So we have to have that pass role ability. So uh, that's part of IAM. So we're gonna be able to pass roles and then we could lock this down. Uh, it's probably sm smart to lock this down. So I'll show you how to lock this one down uh, so it can't just pass any role over to the uh, ECS task, only the, the default role. So if we open up IAM again over here, we can go and get the ARN for that role. So the, the role we wanted was this ECS task execution role. Uh, I believe we used this first one. And we can just copy this error in at the top. So I just hit this copy button here. And then we can paste it uh, right here. So we add error in and put in the role. So you can call this ECS task bat lambda exec. And we can reuse this policy later if we wanted to. Okay. So now our, our policy is set up. If we go back to Lambda and we refresh it, then we can see now it has access to EC2 container service and this identity access management. And then we can go ahead and test it and we'll get a successful response. So the ECS task response, tasks, blah, 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 blah all this jargon. This is a response from ECS. We go over to ECS, we see our, uh, inside of our cluster, we can refresh it, and we see the task is pending, and it'll run, it'll fire, and it'll, it'll uh, shut itself down. So that's it, that's the fat lambda strategy. So the lambda passed off the execution to this ECS task. Uh, you could pass more information to it, uh, especially through environment variables, what we do is we pass over uh, some of the SQS queues for it to check. So then the uh, ECS task will check all those SQS queues to load up the batches. So we saved and tested. And then we can go farther. We can hook up the Lambda to actual events. You know, we could hand it to S3 when an object is created, or you know, we could hook up to the API gateway when a request comes in. However you want to hook it up, uh, you have all the power of Lambda at that point for hookups. Let's talk about price. So Fargate actually costs about double the price of similar EC2 on-demand instances. So if you look over on the pricing over here, you see the EC2 price that includes a 20 gigabyte volume versus the Fargate price, which is a 10 gigabyte volume. Uh, and you can see even for the lowest level of Fargate, 
you're charged about two cents per hour. Now, if you use the lowest level of uh, EC2, which is a T2 nano, you're charged less than a cent per hour. So that's an increase of 221 percent. Now, if you if you move up the line to a bigger uh, Fargate instance down here, you see a four vCPU instance, which is the biggest one you can get with 16 gigabytes of memory, which is not the biggest. You can get you can go to 30, but in order to match it with the T2 extra large, it's set to 16. You still have a 215 percent price premium over the uh, raw running of that T2 extra large. In addition, you know there's an on-demand price for EC2. You could go even f farther down if you use a reserved instance for EC2 or you use spot instances for EC2. So Fargate is not cost effective if you're running Fargate all the time. What you're paying for with Fargate is the simplicity where you don't need to manage that auto scaling for uh, ECS and for the management of the uh, actual instances. So in conclusion, ECS and Fargate do not directly replace Lambda, but Lambda is enhanced by these tasks, these ECS tasks and services. So ECS provides more power and customizab uh, customizability than Lambda, but there are several costs. Like there's the cost of the actual literal cost of it, and then there's the cost of you have to learn Docker, and the cost of you know, it takes longer to spin up these Docker containers than a Lambda. But if you need it, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely a great tool to have in your, in your AWS toolkit. And in addition to ECS, Fargate is just serverless ECS, and it's a convenience that you pay for. So unlike Lambdas, which are uh, essentially free, sort of, uh, Fargate will cost you double what an EC2 instance will cost. But if you're using Fargate, you know, less than half the time, then, uh, and if you're using an EC2 cluster at half capacity, then they're going to cost the same. So, uh, so it just depends on how often you're firing these tasks is if you want to switch over to EC2 cluster. Thanks. That's in my, in my presentation. If you have any questions, you know, feel free to ask them now. Yeah. So how does uh, Fargate compare to Batch? How does Fargate compare to Batch? So Batch is more managed, so you can run Batches more easily. Uh, but you can run Batches of tasks in Fargate as well. So it's, uh, it's more flexible than Batch, I guess. How oh, yeah. oh, oh, pricing? Yeah. Oh, Pricing-wise? Oh. I don't know. Probably more expensive because it's uh, doesn't Batch use just straight EC2 instances. You can specify the types. Not sure. Who has used Batch here? Anyone use Batch? Yeah. Okay. I have not used Batch personally, but yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Just a question on the retries of the tasks. So if the task fails, what so, so if there the task fails, then. Uh, then you'd have to implement the retry logic yourself. Okay. So uh, our tasks, we just have, since we just have them running every minute, uh, we just let them fail and they notify us, and then the next one just picks up where so they left off. Item yeah. 20, exactly, yeah. So the nice thing is, yeah, if it crashes and burns, then that's just that container. The right. next one will uh, operate differently. Yeah. Is there a scenario where Fargate is cheaper um, than the, you know, the regular resources? So Fargate would be cheaper than EC2 if you're running it very seldomly. So if you're running it less than half the time, then uh, instead of running EC2 cluster all the time, then it would be cheaper than the EC2 cluster. So if your your logs that you were uploading, let's say they were very sporadic, and yeah. they might happen on a basic like once event. a day. Yeah. So the lambda would check to see if the logs are there. However, the, the you, you determine to kick that off, and if they weren't there, it just wouldn't start the EC2. But when they were there as needed, exactly. So if you have a more sporadic workload, then Fargate would be cheaper because then you wouldn't need to 
uh, have that unused capacity sitting there that you're paying for. Any other questions? We could put the whole thing in an AMI, right? Put the whole thing in an AMI. Yeah, you could. You, so you and then just have your lambda just spin up the EC2 instance. That's very true. So that's that's the <laughs> that's the that's the very argument my boss always makes is why are we virtualizing when we're already using virtual machines with EC2? Uh, so uh, the response I always give is it's more portable. So you could have these Docker containers, and you could you know. Like AWS is now. You can have an AMI that has the Docker container running. Yes. All sitting and they're just ready to go. Yeah, you could. Yeah. So uh, the Docker containers are totally an EC2. Uh, they're totally EC2 friendly. You can fire up Docker on EC2 and have it host the containers yourself. Uh, but ECS is the managed version of that for you. Um, but Docker containers you can then take and you can go to, to uh, a Docker swarm somewhere else. Any of the, any of the other clouds will run into. I'm just saying that instead of deploying the Docker container to Fargate, make an AMI instance with the with Docker in it, with the uh, your container already preloaded into it, mm -hmm. and then whenever you need to, just start it. Exactly. Yeah. So you could definitely do that. Yeah. But um, would Fargate give you uh, higher availability and less density? Yes. So yeah, Fargate uh, gives you that. Uh, there's multiple subnets you can set up, so you can just fire whenever subnet's working at that time. You know, if a data center goes down, you don't have to worry. Uh, and you know, as more tests come in, Fargate will bin pack those tests appropriately and uh, and dole them out in a highly available, scalable uh, network architecture. So you don't have to worry about all that management. So you could set all that up, but that's just more knowledge you need to know and, and more maintenance. You have to keep on those AMIs and make sure they're up to date and, and, uh, and just more management you'll have to do. So that's all it comes down to is you know, serverless. You could do all this stuff without serverless, but then you just need to manage more stuff. You just need to worry about more things. So instead, you could just pay Amazon to worry about those things for you. When you're when you're building this, did you consider um, other um, capabilities within AWS? You know, like glue from an ETL standpoint versus doing what you've done. Um, and yeah. Were there limits and drawbacks from going other ways, and this was just more controllable? Or I tried with glue. I tried. I really <laughs> wanted to like glue. I was a, I was an advocate for glue for a while, but just choked so hard, uh, and it cost a lot of money. Uh, especially when it's failing, uh, it'll run. <laughs> if it finds a comma in the wrong place, it'll run for like hours and hours and hours, and then it'll spit out an error message, and you get charged for every single one of those hours. In addition, Glue has uh, this. It has these uh, notebooks that you can run Python in to you know test out your Glue ETL jobs. And those run on really powerful instances, and if you're not using them, you still get charged for them, apparently, which I found out when we got billed. <laughs> it was like $800 bill. Uh, so just, and yeah, so we tried with Glue, but it was, it was slow, and it didn't, it didn't give us any benefit. So maybe if you had more of a, a use case for transforming in Python instead of SQL, like I feel like with SQL, you can do any kind of transform you want uh, over uh, Python row by row. So, uh, so if I'm reading into your answer, you're saying like if it worked, it actually might be a... a yeah, if it worked, glue would be nice, but okay. I feel like glue wasn't ready. So oh, well, I'd like to, I told Rob, I like to call our solution tape, so, <laughs> but it actually works. So, right, so glue. Glue's good, I guess, but it's expensive and unnecessary. So if anyone if anyone has a really good use case for glue and it works, I would love love to see it. Because I really still want to like it. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, we we'll stick around. You can eat more pizza, drink more drinks, hang out. <laughs>